Hello, 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 and welcome to Believe. That's B-L-E-A-V in Lions, right here on the Believe Network. As always, I'm your host at Javanaugh87, Jack Kavanaugh. And as always, I am joined by the NFL safety, the all-pro, the photographer, the interception leader, Glover Quinn Jr. What is up, man? That is that intro never gets old. I just got to say, it never gets old. <laughs> just got to remind the people and you just how special you really were on that football field. You know, that was that was great time, man. I I I kid you not, man. I I wouldn't have traded that time for for anything, man. I was talking about it the other day with one of with my brother-in-law. We were just talking about the Houston and the Detroit and kind of how it all kind of played out and you know, feelings of, you know, how the Texas did it and all these different things. And I was just like, man, you know what? It played out the way it should have. You know, I think coming to Detroit was a move that I definitely was unsure about, but I knew I knew what I could do. And it 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 was absolutely amazing. I had a great time in Detroit playing for the Detroit Lions. So yeah, man, it was a fun time. I can't lie. This sun is really coming through super strong right now, yeah. right here in you my almost face. needed some shades like I've got here. Golly. <laughs> I need something. Oh my gosh. All right. We're, we're we'll be okay. It'll go up in a little bit closer and get to 620. The future's just too bright. It's cl- it's clouding your eyes, shining is, right down. That is an on awesome you. tagline. That is an awesome tagline. <laughs> Our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all of the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including Major League Baseball, the latest fighting news, and even next season's early NFL futures. So head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Just use our promo code BELIEVE to get the bonus and get into the action. That's B-L-E-A-V. Bet online where the game starts. The future <laughs> is too bright, and the future's looking bright for one Atlanta Hawks star, Clint Capella, after getting to hang out with you recently for a workout session. <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it it, it was uh, it was a photo shoot that um, you know, the trainer um, Dos Congo. Um, he trained me while I was playing football. So I used to go to him every, every summer. We, he would train me, um, strength, condition, all those different things. And so he trains other athletes. And so, um, he reached out to me and asked me if I would come out and, you know, if I wanted to come get some shots of, of Clint, cause you know, I've been doing the photography thing. I had shot, you know, their run event that they did a couple weeks ago. And so, um, the first time he asked, I couldn't make it. And so um, an opportunity presented itself. I think it was the 4th of July. I think it was actually the morning of 4th of July. And um, I went out, man. And it was, it was cool, man. It was cool to go out, you know, for, you know, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the game. So anytime I meet another pro, uh, I'm always, you know, excited. You know what I'm saying? Just to meet, meet other guys, um, see how they are. Um, he's definitely tall. Like those basketball players are freaking tall, dude. Like unreal tall but you know what it, it was fun it was good for me to to go out and and you know get some more experience shooting um photography is something that you know i love to do and it's um it's gonna be a second career of mine I, you know i don't know if i'll make as much money in photography as i made uh playing football maybe i'll make more i don't know i can do photography from now until i can't take another picture um, but you know what is 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 fun. It's something 
super cool to do and it's so memorable to to capture moments i love i love moments i love capturing moments and so to, to be able to go out and shoot get some practice get some good shots of of clint and um you know kind of put those things out there man it, it, was, it was a lot of fun and I, I imagine the reason they wanted you behind the camera and not working out with them is because they, they didn't want to be shown up. You know, he's the current athlete, can't be exposed by the retired pro. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. You know what? I, I'm still in pretty good shape. You know, I, I still I still work out. Um, I still I still get it in. So I'm in I'm in decent shape. And so I'm uh, still strong. Um yeah, I stay behind the camera with those guys. I don't want to show those guys up. Totally understand. And if you want to see these pictures, you can find them over at Glover Quinn Photos and on your main page, Glover Quinn. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, you know, a few different pages. You know, I like to use social media and Instagram for what it is. It's, it's a promotional platform. And so, you know, I'm trying to start. I'm getting more into posting uh, more football and content about myself on my personal page for the lawyer fans that have followed me throughout this time. And, you know, some of them football fans, some of them personal fans that just want to see what I got going on. I'm trying to do a lot better job of engaging. I've really been locked into learning, practicing, um, educating myself, doing all those different things. And so really going to start back connecting with those guys on my personal page. But I also feel like, you know, everybody may not be into my photography journey. So if you are, and you just want to see the photos, just follow the Global Queen photos page. Or if you just like sneakers and you want to see some cool sneakers every now and then, just follow the GQ sneakers page. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't have to follow me to support those pages and you don't have to support those pages to follow me. But if you're following me, you're going to see some football stuff. You're going to see some daddy stuff. You're going to see some podcast stuff. You're going to see some behind the scenes of me shooting those pictures. That's the type of stuff you're going to see on my page. So if you're into that stuff, then cool. Follow me. Um, should be a good time, man. It's a great time, especially if you follow all of those accounts for the full GQ experience. <laughs> You know what? It's a lot, man. It 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 really is a lot. I gotta find me a partner, um, like like a creative partner. I I, I really want to find a creative partner, someone that you know I can shoot with, I can edit with, I can you know we can make make content with ideas. Really want to find somebody that's you know hungry, you know wants to learn, not afraid of failing, not afraid of putting themselves out there. So many people, you know miss out on opportunities because they're afraid to put themselves out there. They're afraid of what people are going to say. And, and, you know, I feel like for me, one thing, you know, with, with playing professional ball and all those different things, like you just can't be afraid to put yourself out there. You just got to jump out there. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day and I was like, you know, we always say, um, you know, just jump in the water. You're going to, you're going to sink or you're going to swim. Right. But that also depends on how deep the water is. You could just stand up and walk. You know what I'm saying? Like, so don't be afraid to jump in there and think, thinking, well, I don't really know how to do this. So it may be too deep for me. Just stand up and walk. You know what I'm saying? Take your time. Go at your pace. Learn it. I mean, there's 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 somebody out there for everybody. You know what I'm saying? There's there's some high end photographers that charge a whole lot of money and they're really good. And there's people that require their service. There are some low end photographers who are not really very good. They don't charge a lot of money and there's people that want their service. So don't be afraid to put yourself out there, man, and believe in what you do. Educate yourself, practice, practice, practice. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a partner. I want to find a partner, somebody that I can, that I can work with, create with and uh, do some cool stuff. Well, whoever that ends up being sounds like a lucky individual. Make sure you hit Glover up if that sounds like something you are interested in. And I really like that message you have there because one of the phrases that I like to stand on is the worst that can happen is it doesn't work out. Or the right. worst they can say is no. Is no. And that's it. And that's then it. you move on. That's it. That's That's the worst thing that can happen, you know. 
And if you look at it from a lot of the successful people, the higher up people, if you want to call them that, you know, they don't look at it as a failure. They just look at it as, you know what, you learn from that opportunity. You learn from that. Like, why did it not work out? What happened? What did you do wrong? Did you not put enough time into it? Did you not, you know, communicate well enough with your clients? Did you not, like, what did you do wrong to cause it to, in your in, in your mind, in that situation, not work? Okay, so then the next time, let's be better at that. Let's let's communicate better. Let's work a little hard. Let's learn a little more. Let's get more sleep. Let's let's work out more. Like whatever it is that you felt like was the cause of it not working the first time, learn from that so that it don't happen again the second time. And that's the thing is you can learn from every experience, whether it's on the NFL field, whether it's in the photography lab, whether it's working out with former a- or current athletes, or it's switching sports from football to boxing, which is something that's starting to happen with Adrian Peterson versus Le'Veon Bell set to take place. And I think a little under a month at this point. Yeah. And you, I mean, you're seeing it a lot. You're seeing these football players. I think Frank Gore got in the ring. Ocho yep. Cinco was in the ring. You know, Greg Hardy went to the UFC stuff. Like, you know, hey, man, more power to those guys. I, I do boxing workouts. You know, that's what I do for my workouts nowadays. I box. It's great cardio, great muscle stuff. It's, it's good for me, low compact, low, low impact on my knees and ankles and hips and joints. It's just good workouts right but i'm not trying to get in the ring and fight somebody (laughs) like i don't care if it's charity i don't care if it's like like they always say you can't play fight no how do you play fight all right we're gonna get in here and box but you know what i'm saying we're just gonna kind of play around no you can no no face shots right like (laughs) I do that with my kids. Like, hey, we'll, we we can box, we can fight, but it's all body shots, right? We we all body shots. We don't hit in the face. But I'm with my kids. I'm playing around with my 12-year-old, my 10-year-old, my 7-year-old. I'm not getting in the ring with a grown person boxing, bro. Like, I got zero to prove to anybody. No, no, definitely not. So then, but, but to see two running backs, like, it would have been different if one of those guys would have fought like a linebacker. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're fighting a running back. Like, you guys are supposed to be on the same team. You're fighting a running back. Go fight a D line. Go fight a linebacker. You know what I'm saying? Like, go fight Bart Scott or somebody. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> go fight a linebacker for charity. Fight another running back. Yeah, oh my gosh. But so, do you have a pick in this fight? And uh, what was it like? playing these guys clearly they like the contact if they're going from the nfl field to the boxing ring man you know and i don't know how much they're getting paid for this stuff Mm -hmm. but you gotta wonder do they really love fighting like that or i mean is it is it about a paycheck like like why would you be fighting somebody and then you know adrian peterson he doesn't have like a play bone in his body right yeah you know he's going out there like to fight yeah, And then, you know, Le'Veon Bell is going to fight because neither one of those guys want to get, like, caught on the low and get knocked out because, yeah. like I said, you can't play boxing. Like, you don't have to even really try to hit somebody hard. But if you hit them right and you hit them on the chin or in the right spot, they're going down. So, you know those guys. It's going to turn into an all-out brawl. Like, it's going to turn into probably... I'm not going to say it's going to be one of the best boxing matches of the year, but it will probably be one of the best fights because it's going to turn into a fight. Guaranteed. That's that's where I'm leaning to. It's going to be a good old fashioned slobber knocker between the two of them. And I really don't know who's going to come out victorious. Mm. I think I lean towards AP just because, as you said, he doesn't have a play bone. He doesn't. He doesn't have a, a take a take a take a minute off bone in his body. Right, and and if you look at their their football styles, and you 
you know, link those that to their boxing styles, you would say that AP is going to be ultra aggressive, but you got to be careful. Le'Veon might pick him apart, be patient, and land the one shot that ends the night. Definitely. That's just something that we're going to have to look out for <laughs> come this boxing match. It is what a world that we live in right now. It's crazy. One of the things I want to know, though, is do you have any former teammates that tried to cross sports? Maybe not just boxing, but anything else. And if not, who do you think w f that you played with would make the scariest uh, boxer? Um, no, I don't know anybody that really tried to cross, cross sport, any sport, basketball, nobody I played with did baseball. I mean, I don't even think you can include golf because all those guys try to do golf, but, um, nobody that I know of, but somebody that I played with that probably would be a good boxer. Um... Ooh, you know, it would be interesting. This is back in my Houston days, but it'd be interesting to see like Brian Cushion and like UFC. Ooh. You know, it would be that would be that would be interesting to see him in UFC. Um Bernard Pollard, he was also in my Houston days. You know, see him boxing or some kind of fighting. That would that would that would be fun. Um you know, in my in my Detroit days, you know, Tahir Whitehead used to he used to really do a lot in Detroit with the with the boxing. Um, it was a boxing gym out there that he supported a lot. And, you know, I think he has a love for it. he he made a box. Um but other than that, I mean, you you know, you just got different guys, man. I remember when I first got there, Ashley Palmer, you know. Who knows? Um, DeAndre Levy, he like yeah. he could be like a I wouldn't say boxing or UFC, but more like a jujitsu or like some kind of like maybe maybe some kind of UFC, like you know, where you can, you know, wrestle and grapple and box and kick and do all the different things. You know what I'm saying? Like that that's kind of what Levy seemed like. He would be very tactical fighter. Um, but yeah, that, that's about it. I don't think I, I played with a DB that I would say like, okay, he's going to cross over and be a fighter. That that's fair. That's fair. I think some people might be surprised that you didn't take Andre Johnson after what we saw him do to Cortland Finnegan all those years ago, but <laughs> I get it. You know, I don't, I don't. You know, just knowing Andre, that's not even his personality. So, no, that's why it was so surprising yeah, at the time. Yeah. So that's why I say I can't see him as a boxer. Like, he'll fight if he's pushed all the way to the edge of the cliff. You know what I'm saying? But, like, think about how much you got to do to get him to fight. Yeah. You know, boxers, I mean, they won't, They wake up wanting to fight for the most part. You know what I'm saying? So, nah, Andre's, I don't see him as a fighter. Too nah. nice of a guy. Too nice yeah, of a guy. too nice too of a guy. Even if he did win that fight that he had in the NFL. He did, win. <laughs> he did win. I had front row seats, like literally front row, like literally right there in front of me. That must have been uh, the, probably the cheapest that you actually ever had to pay for get ringside tickets. Oh, yeah. You know what? And that was such a, <laughs> that was such a crazy game because, you know what's funny? That was the game that I caught three interceptions in one game. And that nobody, no, nobody remembers it because that's also the game that Andre fought Cortland Finnegan. <laughs> I didn't know that was the game because I know you had that three pick game. I didn't yeah. know that was it. That oh was the game. goodness! That was the game. Talk didn't about. Even, I don't even think it got a highlight on Sports Center that night because the whole Sports Center was the fight. Yeah, it was showing all the plays that Andre was making against Cortland and them going to get at each other throughout the whole game, which led up to the fight. So, and we beat Tennessee like 20 to zero that game. So it wasn't like it was a lot of highlights from Tennessee 
that they were showing. So they would show all the Andre Johnson plays and how Cortland was acting and all those things, which led up to the fight. But I don't remember seeing not one, not one of the interceptions on ESPN. None. <sighs> heartbreaking. It's, Truly no, it's heartbreaking. All good. It's all good. It's still in the record books. And it's clear <laughs> that the Detroit Lions noticed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it worked out. Do these beefs that happen on the field, do they often carry into other games or when you see each other, say at the Pro Bowl, or is it kind of squashed after one game? You know, I I, I don't really, you know, I never really had a beef like that. I guess in the I can I kind of did have a beef one time. I could tell you about it later, but um, you know, I think if it's a real beef, I think it it I don't think it carries over in a physical or any type of weight at the Pro Bowl like that. If it's a real beef, um, but it may be just some like he on our team, but I don't really get out with him like that. So I'm gonna keep my distance, he keep his distance. We're on the same team, but he's an offensive guy. I'm a defensive guy, right? Um, or, you know, he's a on the other team type of guy, right? Nowadays, you know, I think they pick the teams anyway. So it's like, well, if you know there's a beef with this guy, like, nah, he can't go on. The other guy can't come on the team. Um, but most of the time it's just football beef. You know what I'm saying? You don't yeah. – because you don't really know those guys or have – like a relationship with most of those guys off the field for that to be like a long term standing beef. You know what I'm saying? So it's like we beef on the field. I don't like you on the foot field. And when we going against each other, you know, I'm already going into the game with a little chip on my shoulder. So anything you do to aggravate that chip is going to turn back into the beef. But if you just go out and play your game and I go out and play my game, then there won't be anything. But the minute one of them cross that line, then it's going to be beef. Just makes is sense. what it is. That yeah, makes sense. It's kind of that's what happens in a lot of even lower level sports. If you play rec league, pick up basketball or whatever, a lot of stuff just gets left on the court. That's the nature of competition. And then sometimes there's an awkward situation like with the Carolina Panthers right now, because I don't know if you saw Baker Mayfield headed to Carolina joining the Panthers. And a month or two ago, Robbie Anderson, one of the Panthers top receivers tweeted that he didn't want Baker. He had no interest in Baker Mayfield went on the I am athlete podcast, cleared the air said, Hey, I'm Sam's my guy. I had to have my quarterbacks back. I didn't mean anything against Baker and Sam's just kind of got a, an unfair shake. And so I wanted to support him. Is that just, I, I don't want to talk specifically because we don't know Robbie Anderson or that uh, and what he's thinking, but are those the kinds of things that people just say, cause it's a business and we're going to move on clean slate or is it really just, you got to have your boys back in the moment and then you'll make up for it later. I think that's the case of people feeling themselves and and sometimes doing too much. A lot of times guys feel themselves. They feel that they owe it or they have to comment about everything when you really don't. Like at the end of the day, if you if you understand that there's different roles. There's owners, there's presidents. There's general managers, there's coaches, there's trainers, there's players, right? If you're a player, be a player. You don't have to comment about any of the personnel moves, guys that are free agents, guys that you don't like, because you have no control of those guys being your teammates. And so many times guys make comments, and the next thing you know, they're your teammate. So did you just make that comment to make it? Do you really feel that way? Like, why don't you want Baker Mayfield? Because you're trying to stand up for Sam? 
Or do you feel like Baker's not better than Sam? Is that what you're saying? Because I guarantee you if that was Tom Brady getting ready to come to the Patriots, I mean to the to the Panthers, he probably wouldn't have said no. Right? If probably that was not. Probably somebody not. that he felt like was better than Sam Donald, he probably would have been like, oh man, I can't wait to get to the field, yada, yada, yada. Right? So now he's your on your team. Baker saw it. <laughs> he knows. He knows. He may go out and try to play his game, yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, I mean, he's human, right? Like, he know. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if Robbie's not his favorite target. Like, that stuff is real. Like, you can't. Like, yeah, you go out and try to do your job, but I just don't feel like like you just can't forget that stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, you just don't. And so, like I said, I just feel like there's players, though, feeling themselves or feeling like they're whatever, and they got to come in about something to get notoriety or to get a headline or to whatever, this and this and that. Baker's a free agent. He or Baker may get traded to the Panthers. Like, you don't have to respond to that publicly. Talk to your homeboy. Tell your homeboy, like, bro, I hope we don't get Baker. Like, golly. Tell your homeboy. You ain't got to tell the world. The next thing you know, Baker's your teammate. Then what? You know what? I had to have my quarterbacks back. Like, well, now he's your quarterback. <laughs> you like, just nah. be quiet, man. Just be quiet, you know. You don't have to come in on things that you can't control and roster moves. You can't control them. Guys are fighting you one day and your teammate the next day. Like, so and when I play, I, I literally try to let the coaches coach, let the owners own, let the managers manage and let's let me play. You know, you ask my opinion about something, I give it to you, but I'm not here to tell you who to draft, who not to draft, who to sign, who not to sign. Like, that's your job. My job is to go out there and play. So that's what I'm going to try to do. And that's kind of what Baker had said before this season coming in. I know he had the shoulder injury and everything, but he said that he learned you don't have to respond to everything. You can just ignore it sometimes. And, that's why he and Rex Ryan were able to squash the beef that they had was because Baker's like, yeah, you know, I, I didn't need to reply to that. I know it's your job as a talking head. We're good. And I think a lot of people just need to learn. Sometimes you don't need to fight everyone. You don't need to react to every even little slight or, if even the piece of news. No, you know, and and I, and I think that that brings more to you, right? That brings more of that stuff to you because the fans, you know, the fans understand, right? And like I remember when I was young on Twitter or Instagram, one of them, and it was a fan talking pretty reckless, right? And I and I made a comment to him, and he said something to me that changed the way that I look at stuff and think about stuff so much you know he literally said man i really didn't mean any of that stuff i'm a huge fan i just wanted you to come in so a lot of times you get these guys that are saying some of the craziest stuff right they saying awful things calling you names and telling you how much you suck and all this and this and that just so they can get your attention just so you can read their message and be like, nah, man, bump this. I'm going to say something. Then they go tell their friends, bro, I got such and such to respond to me. Like, this is, this is cool, right? Um, and so when players know or when fans know, hey, man, this dude right here, he always clapping back. Hey, he always going at people. Like, hey, he always responding. He don't let nobody slide. So, sure, why not say something crazy? So I can get him to say something crazy to me. Like, to them, that's cool because they're probably like, I'm never going to meet Baker Mayfield in my life. So 
You know what I'm saying? So once you understand that, you don't feel the need to respond to all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? Analysts are going to analyze. They're going to talk. Critics are going to always find something to criticize. That's just why they're called a critic. They're going to find something to criticize regardless of what it is. Analysts, they're going to find something to analyze. This just is what it is. And it's media today. It's stories. It's the off season. It's storylines. Like they got to find something to talk about. Just is what it is. So anything you do say, put out there, they're going to find it. They're going to talk about it. It's going to be on TV. So, hey, man, you don't have to respond to everything. You don't have to get all butt hurt about everything. Like, man, just let people talk. Let people have their opinions and go about your day, man. Don't stress about it and worry about all that stuff. It's almost the Kevin Durant effect where <laughs> oh when you respond to it once, it comes in more and then you respond to it again and then it piles on more and it just builds and builds into something that gets completely out of control. Yep. And you know, some people like that, you know what I'm saying? Some of these guys, you know what I'm saying? In their mind, they don't really care, Mm -hmm. you know, negative media, positive media to them. It's all the same thing. I'm trending. They're talking about me on the sports TV because it's the it's the huge world. There's going to be anything that you do. There's going to be lots of people that love you. And there's going to be lots of people that hate you. Just is what it is. So however you handle a situation, there's going to be people out there that that thinks, yeah, man, you should stick up for yourself. You should say something to all these people that are trying to say you should do that stuff. There's going to be people that want to support you and will give you stuff and be on your side for acting that way. There's going to be a lot of people that feel like, bro, why are you wasting your time? This and this and that. Like, you should just be doing this. So you can't please everybody. You just got to be you. So if you're a person that likes to do that, then just do it. But then don't complain about it when you get a bunch of them because you're going to get them. Like, I don't really get many of them because I don't even talk back to them. Like, (laughs) I just block you. Like, if you don't, if you want to act like that on my page, I just block you. Like, I don't have time for it on my page. Like. And different people have different ways of creating that chip on your shoulder. You know, Michael Jordan, if you looked at him funny or didn't squeeze his hand hard enough in the handshake, that's it. And now you're his enemy. And so for some people, that might be their way of keeping that chip is bringing in the haters on the Internet to rile them up. And that gets the adrenaline pumping and makes them play even better. You never know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I can see that. I can definitely see that. It just takes all sorts to make an NFL team, make an NBA team, and to make a defense work. And that's something that people have been talking about a lot lately is to make this Aaron Glenn defense work. Everyone keeps saying, oh, it's difficult on the safeties. They really stress the safeties. Safeties have to do a lot. What? does that actually mean when people say that it's tough to be a safety in Aaron Glenn's defense versus another scheme? What? Well, that all depends on what they're asking you to do in a certain inside of a certain scheme. Some schemes, they run cover two. So the safeties are just playing cover two, make sure the ball stays in front, come up and tackle. Cover two can be difficult if you can't play in space. It can be difficult if you're not you know, don't have good ball skills. Cover two could be boring, which makes it difficult because you go a lot of the game and you're not really in the action. Um, Then you can have schemes where, you know, it's predominantly strong safety, free safety. So one safety is predominantly down in the box. The other one is predominantly free. Um, Those are not difficult, but then you can have safeties systems where the safeties have to do a lot right we're 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 not just playing you know down and free you know both you guys are going to be down at times both you guys are going to be back sometimes both you guys are going to blitz sometimes i need you guys to be able to cover the slots because we're not bringing our corners over so you know some defenses if they go like a slot and put two wide receivers on one side if they're in man to man the other corner comes over so now you got two corners on the same side and then they probably got a tight end on the backside, right? Well, some teams to disguise their man to man, instead of that corner coming over, we just let our safety cover that slot wide receiver. Now they think we're in zone, but we're really playing man to man. 
right? Mm -hmm. And then some teams teams do it the other way. Wade Phillips was wide receivers are going to always be covered by the corners. So if 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 they were in slot, the two corners would come over. We may still be playing zone, but the corner was coming over, so they thought it was man. Um, and you can have those schemes where you're having to do a lot of that stuff. You can have schemes where the safeties are having to communicate with the linebackers a lot because they're dropping down in different fire zones and different coverages where they're having to work with the linebackers. But they also got to be able to work with the corners. They got to work with the other safety. So they got to know blitzes. They got to know different schemes. They got to know different things. So um, depending on what all he's asking the safeties to do, you know, that could be a lot for, for a lot of people. And that makes sense because a lot of these reports relate to the rookie Kirby Joseph, and it's more of pre-snap things. It's often he's not aligned in the right spot at the snap, and so he's playing catch-up. And he's still making plays all over camp, but it seems as though Aaron Glenn wants to show you a lot of different looks and then either change at the last second or show something else after the snap. Right. And, you know, and, you know, for me, when it comes to disguise, I, I've never believed in disguising yourself out of your job. You know what I'm saying? So don't try to do something so crazy that it, it puts you in a situation where you can't get your job done. But at the end of the day, to me, this was me. I like to make it look the same every play pre-snap. I don't, I never really liked you know, if it's cover one, I'm going to show cover two and roll down. Or if it's cover two, I'm going to show cover one and run out of it. Like, I never really liked it because when you play against the good quarterbacks, they know. They know, all right, this linebacker is not walked out on the slot. So I know somebody's got to come down and cover the slot. Somebody has to come down and cover the slot. So the safety's coming down. He's showing cover two right now, but he's coming down. The linebacker's too scared to walk out there and 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 cover him up, right? Or they look at certain things and it's like, all right, well, we know he's gonna run out of there. It's cover two. Like they know those, they know those things a good quarterback. So for me, I'm like, let's just make every play look the same. Now he don't know. He don't know if I'm in cover two because when I'm in cover two, this is what I look like. When I'm in cover one, this is what I look like. When I'm in a fire zone, this is what I look like. So now he doesn't really know. He got to figure it out after the ball has been snapped, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a little secret for the safeties. Soon as the ball is snapped, you don't automatically have to take off running. Just give it a half a second pause just to let the quarterback have to wait just that much longer to figure it out. Because if as soon as the ball is snapped, you take off running to the middle, he already know right now it's a single high defense. He already know right now it's single high. So he knows, boom, single high, I'm going backside, period. Zone or man, I'm going backside. Because he knows if it's man, it's going to be cover one. And if it's zone, it's going to be some form of cover three because you're running to the middle of the field, right? So when they say hut, if you just give just a little pause, 1,001, and then move, that's just another time for the quarterback to get the ball He's coming back. He's looking at you, and you still haven't moved. So now he still doesn't know. And then all of a sudden, you take off running. Now it's like, oh, it's oh, cover one. Then once he go to the backside, that gives your rush that much more time to get there. It just throws off the timing. Just, just that fraction of a second is what I'm hearing. Yep. Just That's all it takes. Thinks a little bit more pass rush gets an extra step on it. The corner, maybe he gets a little bit more hands on. Yep. That's, that's all it takes. I have a pause when I, when, when, you know, when, when we played the saints back in 2014 and I had the interception against Drew Brees, right. And me and James ahead of bowl, we were in a uh, cover one hole, like a run one robber concept. And, you know, James Ahedebo had been the robber safety the whole game. And I was always the high safety. And on this play, we switched it, right? I let James Ahedebo be the high safety. And I was the down safety because Drew Brees very rarely saw me as the down safety, right? Mm -hmm. So when he saw James Ahedebo playing high, right? Well, then he automatically assumed if James Ahedebo was playing high, then GQ is definitely playing high because he's always the high safety, right? So once he saw James Ahedebo high, and I wasn't as high, 
he thought we were in some form of quarters on one side and probably halves on the other side, right? So he knew he had Marcus Colston or whoever their receiver was in the slot one-on-one. That's what he knew. So as soon as Marcus Colston beat the, the nickel across his face to the inside, which when you're playing one hole, one robber, you want to lose to the inside, mm-hmm. right? Because that's where the robber is. That's where the help is. You don't want to be inside and the, and the robber is inside and then they break outside. There's nobody out there because those guys are in man-to-man coverage, right? So if you got help coming from this side, then you want to play on this side, right? So the way it played out, if I would have took off running down into the middle, Drew Brees would have never threw the ball because he would have knew what we were in. But I just held it for a half a second. Why? Because it was like third and 12. So I know those routes got to be at least 10 to 12 to 15 yards. I don't have to run down and defend a five-yard slant. I just make the tackle and it's fourth down. Those routes are going to last longer, so I don't have to be in a hurry. So at the snap of the ball, I just kind of stood there and watched him. So he think I'm in quarters on the backside because he see James going high. So he thinks James is playing halves to one side. GQ's in quarter on this side. So they release the receiver inside to try to take me because they know in quarters, if that receiver release inside, the safety has to pick him up. And the corner is going to be on him. So we're going to take this guy, run him inside and run him up. And he's going to take both of these guys. This safety is going high. So we're going to have our slot one-on-one in the middle of the field. If he win, we win the play. Problem is, I wasn't in quarters. I was the one-hole guy. But I held it for a half a second at the snap. He looks at the slot. Slot slips to the outside which is what he's supposed to do, right? He's supposed to be on the outside. Marcus Colson breaks to the inside. He thinks he's wide open. Nope, here comes the robber. And that's how you get another (laughs) interception into the hands of Glover (sighs) Quinn. So was that your decision to swap with Diggs or was it uh, the coach called it and you just- No, that was was an on-field thing. Nice. That was just on field, like, hey, bro, let me get this one. Like, hey, let me get this one. Big moment, you know. And not that I didn't think Diggs could make the play. It was just, you know, Drew Brees is such a great quarterback. And, you know, we had been showing him a look all game. You know what I'm saying? Every time we had ran one hole that game, Diggs was the drop-in guy. You know what I'm saying? And so just to switch it up, you know what I'm saying? But that that right there. Yeah, but that right there also goes to show just like, the the magnitude and the level of championship players and good and good players, right? Like not just me, but like think about it from James ahead of both standpoint. It's third and twelve, right? In the fourth quarter, right? We call one hole, which you're the robber. You're the guy that's supposed to help give us a chance to win the game. Either help break up a play on third down, catch like you're the guy that they're calling this play for. And so for me to say, hey, man, let me take this one. And for him to be humble enough and not selfish and say, all right, yeah, let's do that. That'll work. And go and play the half and, you know, allow me to have that opportunity. And, yes, I made the play, which was a huge play in my career, huge play in, in, in Lions history, you know, recent history and all those different things. That just shows the the championship caliber player that Diggs is. That's like, hey man, it's not about me or whatever. It's about winning the game. If you if you feeling like like yeah, let's go win the game. I don't have a problem, you know, giving up that moment for for us to try to win the game. And so, you know, shout out to my dog James and Hennepo. But um, that's how that's how championship caliber teams are. He could have re- easily been selfish and been like, no, 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 I got it, I got it, I got it. And not saying he couldn't have made the play, but who knows what would have happened. Who knows if it's just an incomplete instead of an interception because Drew Brees reads it the way that it he's been reading it all game. Right. It just goes to show all the things that us as fans have no idea about 
from a play to play basis. Yeah, no, and that's that leads to exactly what we were talking about earlier. There's no need to argue with the fans. They don't have an idea what's going on. They don't know. They do not know what's going on. They don't know what's been talked about throughout the whole week. They don't know what's been talked about on the sideline. They don't know. Even if they look at the film and feel like, oh, I know the football. That's cover three. He's supposed to have been doing this. You don't know what the game plan is. Just because it's cover three doesn't mean you don't have something in the game plan like, hey, we're playing cover three, but to his side, because we know the routes he like to run, I want you to play your cover three like this. Yeah. Because it's going to stop them this, this week. That's not how we play it every week, but for this week, for this game plan, when we play cover three, we want to do it like this. And then they make a play against it, and so they show it on the, the wide camera, and people see, oh, they were in cover three. Why is he peeking in trying to steal this backside? Well, that was the game plan. Yeah. They just made a play on us and adjust it. That's what it is, right? We had a game plan. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. They just countered it at the right time, and they made a play. Because it can so easily go the other way, right? They can think we're in cover three, and they know, hey, man, that corner is supposed to be high on the backside. We should be able to get this backside posted, this backside skinny on this backside dig. And then the corner jumps it. And they're like, how does this guy go and jump this play? He's supposed to be the high guy. He's supposed to be outside. Yeah, but the game plan this week is different. So it works both ways. So that's why, you know, you just let the fans talk. Let fans be fans. Let them watch the game. Let them assume and think whatever they want to think. I think social media makes players and people feel like they got to explain themselves because when you got a bunch of followers and like I said, you get to trending for the wrong reasons, people talking about you, saying you suck and this and this and that, you feel like you need to defend yourself. So when you're playing a game on national TV and you're playing in front of a lot of people and you know a lot of people are watching, you make a mistake, you're quick to try to like throw your other teammates under the bus so it's not about, so it, so it doesn't look like your fault. And it's like, bro, stop worrying about the fans. Like, let fans be fans. Let them enjoy the game and say what they want to say. Like, we play the game. We understand what's going on. The rest of the NFL knows what's going on. You know, it might look bad to the world, but to the other coaches, they might be like, oh, I, I understand. I know what they were doing right there. It don't look bad to those guys. So who cares? The, the, the fans aren't, you know, they don't know. So you got to let them be fans and encourage them to be fans. Like, let I mean, you want them to be excited about the game. You want them to talk about the game, good or bad. Let them talk. You know, as long as they're not disrespectful and, you know, saying stuff that, you know, definitely shouldn't be the line that shouldn't be crossed, let them talk, man. Let them be fans. That's what makes it fun. And one of the best responses I hear from current, former, all sorts of players is, you know what? My coach is happy. My grading sheet shows a bunch of check marks. I don't care if I got a bad grade from this website. I don't care if this fan is mad at me for this, because at the end of the day, I know what I accomplished. My coach knows what I accomplished and it shows on the grading sheet. And I'll put my grading sheet up against anyone and prove that. Right. Because like I said, in the same general sense, right? These websites that are grading players, they're grading players based off of the generic scheme of the defense. You guys are playing cover two. This is what's supposed to happen in a generic cover two. You guys are playing cover one. This is what's supposed to happen. You guys are playing cover four or three, right? So that grade guys based off of those generic things, they don't know what the game plan was. Mm -hmm. So they might dock you a point for this right here because they felt like you know, it's cover three, so this guy should be covering him right here. But it's not how it was for that week so when i go and get my grade sheet i grade it out at a 95 i look at the grading websites or the pro football focus and they got me grading out as a 75 how did i grade out as a 75 how did i give up three passes like i wasn't even <laughs> you know i i totally understand yeah it's just all the things that go into it was there a bracket on this play? Was there the outside alignment? It's just, there's a lot that goes into each and every play that unless you're in the huddle on the field, you just can't find I'm in the headset too. 
there's just no way to know. And especially when it comes to responsibilities in pass rush or alignment, because one of the things I'm hearing a lot about Lions OTAs a couple weeks ago was it's rare to see three off ball linebackers on the field together. Not that they won't have three linebackers, but when they do, it's more of a five two four with that Sam linebacker, that outside linebacker kind of walked up on the edge. Mm -hmm. And so I think that also confuses a lot of people because what is the responsibility of that player? Is it just to set the edge? Do they have coverage responsibilities? Are they faking uh, the pass rush and dropping back? It's very confusing to a lot of people that are just watching with the naked eye. And so what kind of goes into a 4-3 versus a 5-2 versus a 3-4? And does it really matter from a safety position? And it's more about the run fits up front. Well, I mean, it has a little bit to do with everything, the safety position, the run fits, the the personnel. Um, you know, you go just for the fans, for people who don't know, when you when you say 3-4, I mean, you have three defensive linemen, you have four linebackers. Um, when you say 4-3, that means you have four defensive linemen, three linebackers. And when you say 5-2, that means you generally have five defensive linemen, two linebackers, right? Yeah. And obviously we know that there's – 11 guys on the field. So that would generally leave four secondary guys. Right. Um, but the difference is, you know, when you go a three, four, you're generally going to have the three, four is going to look kind of like a five, two as well. Right. Because you're going to have three defensive linemen, but then you're going to have the two outside linebackers that are most of the time are going to be up on the ball. One's going to be a Will linebacker and one's going to be a Sam linebacker. So the Sam linebacker is going to be lined generally to the strong side. That's why he's the Sam. The Will linebacker is going to be lined to the weak side. That's why he's the Will. Will W weak. Sam S strong, right? Um, and then in the middle, you're going to have your two Mike backers. So those guys are going to be four backers, right? But it's going to look like two backers. You think of back to Denver, right, when they had Von Miller, DeMarcus Ware. Those guys were both linebackers, but they were playing on the ball like defensive ends, right? And they had three down linemen. Like even when I was in Houston, because we had Wade Phillips, he ran the 3-4. You know, we would have uh, Sean Cody, J.J. Watt, and Antonio Smith as three down linemen. But then you will have Mario Williams and Connor Barwin as two outside linebackers. So now you really got five guys on the line. And then you had D'Amico Rines and Brian Cushing in the middle, right? Those are your two middle backers, right? So then if you go with a tradition of 5-2, instead of having three D linemen and two linebackers that are on the ball, you generally have five D linemen on the ball. So then you will have you still you will have your three interior D linemen, but those two outside guys, they would be more defensive ends that are rushing the quarterback probably every time. Mm. Whereas when the three four, the Sam backer may be rushing, but the wheel backer may drop in coverage. Or the wheel backer may rush and the sound backer may drop in coverage because they're linebackers. Yes, they can rush, but they're linebackers. And so when you look at what what you say. Is going on with the Detroit where it gives a 5-2 look. You know, they may be in a 4-3, but then to the strong side or to the weak side, over front, under front, however they want to do it, they may walk a linebacker up, right? And it looks like they got five guys on the line. But they're four defensive linemen and then a rush in. And now this rush in, depending on his skill set, he can do a lot, which can make you versatile. He could rush off the edge or he could cover the tight end because he's probably going to walk up to the side of the tight end, which is be the strong side for run support. Right. That means they got an extra guy over there to help block. So we're going to put an extra guy over here to help set the edge. Right. So if he's covering the tight end, well, you still got two linebackers. Right. So they probably get to cover the backs. Right. So then 
you still have your safeties, right? So you got the corners uh, covering the wide receivers. That leaves two safeties left. So unless you're playing cover two, which you probably won't because this Sam got the tight end man-to-man, now one of your safeties are going to roll down, but they're probably going to be the free guy, right? Because they have nobody to cover unless they're covering the back so your linebackers can blitz. Otherwise, that Sam that's walked up on the ball, he's probably going to go into the rush. And then the safety is going to walk down and cover that tight end. So now you're going to have basically five guys, the four D linemen plus the the outside linebacker. They're going to be rushing the quarterback. You're going to have the two other linebackers that are playing in the middle, and then the safety is going to walk down. So now it's going to look like a 5-3 as opposed to a 4-3. It's going to look like a 5-3. Love the insight of all of these defensive formations, <laughs> the mind games that people play. And it's going to be really exciting to see how this Detroit Lions defense evolves. Sounds like that Sam, that strong side linebacker, that rush end, whatever they call it, whatever the fans want to call it. It's going to be someone like a Jared Davis, who he's a linebacker that can rush or the rookie James Houston. He'll mix in there too. Or it'll be a edge rusher like Austin Bryant or Julian Aquara who can drop in coverage if they have to. Yes, and that, that, that's what I was going to say. You can tell a lot about what they want to do with that guy by who it is. Mm-hmm. You know, if they have a more athletic guy that can cover and he can rush, then they're going to be versatile with that guy. He's going to cover the tight end sometimes. He's going to blitz sometimes. If they got just a big guy there that, you know, probably can't cover, then he's probably there as a run stopper, right? So he's probably not going to be matched up on the tight end many times. He's not probably not going to be dropping to a a hook curl zone many times. He's probably going to be there for run support and to rush the passer. So you can tell a lot by just who they got in that position, what they want to do with him just based off of his skill set, you know. I mean, they can't they can't survive having a guy that, that's not as athletic or don't have the ability to cover to be put in a situation where he's covering those tight ends or things like that and, and man-to-man cover. So they're going to get him out the way and let the safety cover him. And we'll wrap up the scheme coverage because I'm sure a lot of our listeners are just – soaking it all in (laughs) one final question before we get out of here it was the fourth of july recently which means nathan's hot dog eating contest is happening joey chestnut he failed to come close to the record he set last year but still dominated the field and so the question on everyone's mind is if usain bolt and joey chestnut were to run a hundred meter dash but they had to eat a hot dog first. Who wins that? Usain Bolt. Think so? I mean, how fast is Joey Chestnut? That's the question. Because if he runs, say, a 20 second, 25 second, 100 meter, that means it's only 15 seconds for Usain Bolt to eat a hot dog. And I think he can do that. I mean, I think you can eat a hot dog. In five seconds. <laughs> it don't take long to eat a hot dog. They're not. I mean, a hot dog is three bites. <laughs> Two if you're in a hurry. 15 seconds to eat a hot dog? Oh, my gosh. So yeah, Usain I'm going Bolt. Usain Bolt. It's Officially. not going to take him that long to eat a hot dog. That's Unless he... Joey Chestnut. Like, if Joey Chestnut is... Justin Gatlin or Tyreek Hill, where it's like, hey, man, you're only beating me by a little bit anyway, and I can eat this. If I can get this hot dog down before you and get like a three-tenths of a second head start, I might beat you. Like, Joey Chestnut ain't running that fast, bro. It ain't going <laughs> to take you same boat that long to eat a hot dog. Trust me. 
he warms up for the Olympics with chicken McNuggets. I think right. that he can dust a hot dog and then dust a hundred meter. But that's a question that was on everyone's mind on the 4th of July. I think it was Hunter Renfro, the receiver from the Raiders that got everyone thinking about it this year. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm going <laughs> in the same boat. I'm going you, boat. I'm going bolt too. And if you want if that event ever happens, you can use our friends over at betonline.ag to place that bet. But before we get out of here, is there any pluggables that you want to cl- plug, Glover, or anything you want to highlight before we get out of here? You know, that's that's about it, man. I think I think we I think we covered a lot. We talked about the social media, we talked about the 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 teams, the guys. You know, you guys are getting ready to start back into training camp. You know what I'm saying? These players. It's mid-June right now. So this right here is high, 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 high training time. This is high training time. I mean, summer vacation should be over with. You know, I don't know when exactly mini camps ended. You know, if you took a vacation after mini camp, cool. But, you know, this is time. You probably got about two weeks before you're going to be heading back to work. And so it's time now to start getting your mind right to to – be there for the long haul. You can't can't wait can't wait till the week before the day before. Like start start preparing yourself mentally now to to be there every single day. So that's all I really want to say, man, to my to my players out there that's that's that's, that's grinding right now. You know, keep grinding and, and get yourself ready to go have a good season. Because the critics will be talking and the analysts will be analyzing you. And Fortunately enough, they will have us here at the Believe in Lions to not critique so much as analyze in a more positive way, because as always, we do believe in these Detroit Lions here. Yes. So follow us throughout the offseason. We'll be giving you all the training camp updates when those come around. But until then, we will see you next time.